They earned the title world's greatest rock and roll band a long time ago, but the Rolling Stones are still at it, still touring, still making new music. Legends indeed. Do you really know about the tumultuous life behind the fame of Keith Richards, a prominent member of the Rolling Stones and a counterculture icon? His legacy is marked by a series of scandals in the 60s and 70s that left a negative impression on audiences. Notorious for his romantic entanglements, Keith's journey was far from smooth. As he nears 80, many are curious about how he persevered through the challenges he faced. Keith's death-defying stunt. Keith Richards has long lived a life filled with death-defying stunts that would make even the most daring daredevils quiver in their boots. Born on 18th of December 1943 at Livingston Hospital in Dartford, Kent, England, as the only child of Doris Maud Lydia and Herbert William Richards, his existence has been a roller coaster ride of close calls, miraculous escapes, and jaw-dropping incidents, weaving a narrative of tragedy and triumph that transcends the ordinary bounds of mortality. The saga of Keith's close encounters with danger began in 1944, during the intense bombings of London in World War II. As a mere infant, Keith narrowly escaped the wrath of a Nazi V-1 bomb that struck his cot. It was nothing short of fate that led his mother to evacuate the area just in time, sparing them both from certain peril. Little did they know that this was only the first of many brushes with death that would mark Keith's life. Fast forward to 1965, when the stage itself became a battleground of danger for Keith. It was only a couple of years into the Rolling Stones' five-decade career, the band almost lost one of their prime creative forces. While playing a gig in Sacramento, the group launched into The Last Time, and Richards approached the microphone to sing his backing part. It was facing the wrong way, so he attempted to knock it with the neck of his guitar, which resulted in a near-fatal shock. In a blue flash, Richards was knocked unconscious. His guitar strings burned from the accident. In Richards' words, this incident was his most spectacular moment and credited his salvation to a new pair of boots with thick rubber soles. This was only a glimpse into the tumultuous path that lay ahead for the rock icon. The year 1971 brought another brush with peril, as Keith, overcome by sleep and cigarettes, inadvertently sparked a fire that engulfed his bed. The flames threatened not only his own life but also that of Anita Penberg, his then-girlfriend. It was a narrow escape from a catastrophic fate, and the fire made an unwelcome return in 1973, consuming Richard's Redlands estate. Despite Keith's claim that a wire-chewing mouse was to blame, the proximity of danger loomed large, as if that was not enough. In 1998, a seemingly mundane act of reaching for a book in his library led to a catastrophic fall breaking several ribs as heavy volumes tumbled upon him. It was a stark reminder of the fragility of life, even in the most ordinary of activities. Keith later joked that he was lucky to have a good collection of books, otherwise he would have been bored to death. Then came 2006, when a seemingly idyllic scene turned treacherous. While vacationing in Fiji, Keith decided to climb a palm tree to get some fresh coconuts, However, he lost his balance and fell to the ground, suffering a skull fracture that necessitated brain surgery. He miraculously recovered from the ordeal, but not without leaving a permanent dent in his head. Amidst all these death-defying escapades, Keith also had some other notorious acts that landed him in legal troubles. But before that, let's look into this. Richards's Bizarre Tribute in a recent revelation that left the music world in disbelief, the legendary rock icon Keith Richards shared a truly bizarre and unconventional tribute to his late father, Herbert. 
In a candid conversation with NME, Richards nonchalantly recounted the peculiar episode, which he described as a fusion of sorrow, nostalgia, and his own idiosyncrasies. According to his account, he found himself inexplicably drawn to the idea of combining his father's cremated remains with his own stash of cocaine. Yes, you heard that right. Cocaine and his father's ashes. What makes this story even more surreal is the conflicting versions that Richards has shared with different publications. In one telling, he boldly asserted that his father would have approved of this unconventional concoction. However, in another account given to GQ, the narrative took a more accidental turn. Richards claimed that he had intended to scatter his father's ashes to nurture an oak tree, a seemingly poignant and symbolic gesture. But fate had other plans, as some of the ashes ended up spilling onto a table. It was in that surreal moment that Richards made the impulsive decision to snort a line of his father's ashes deeming it a fitting tribute in his own unconventional way. While the sheer peculiarity of this episode may prompt raised eyebrows and shocking gasps, delving into the context of Richards's relationship with his father adds layers of complexity to the narrative. As reported by the Irish Mirror, the father-son duo had endured a 20-year estrangement following Richards' parents' separation. It wasn't until the early 1980s that Richards initiated contact, leading to a heartfelt reunion. Over the ensuing two decades, Richards exposed his father to the tumultuous life of a rolling stone, discovering that Herbert could hold his own in the world of excessive indulgence. By the time of Herbert's passing, the bond between father and son had blossomed into a profound connection. Their journey from estrangement to reconciliation had culminated in a friendship so deep that Richards felt strangely at ease with the unconventional act of snorting his father's ashes, a bizarre yet somehow fitting tribute to a relationship that had weathered years of distance and eventual harmony, Richard's substance saga. The 1970s were a tumultuous time for Keith Richards, as he delved deep into the dark and dangerous world of drug culture. His reckless experimentation with substances lessed with deadly strychnine was a testament to the extreme risks he was willing to take. The inherent dangers of his turbulent life still became increasingly apparent as time went on, leading to a series of harrowing experiences. In 1977, Keith faced a life-altering moment when he was arrested for heroin possession in Toronto, Canada. The possibility of a life sentence loomed over him, casting a shadow of uncertainty on his future. However, he managed to evade this grim fate by pleading guilty and agreeing to perform a benefit concert for the blind. In hindsight, he humorously quipped that he was the only one who could get busted in Canada. But it was a turning point for Keith, as he made a conscious decision to break free from the clutches of drugs. He realized that the path he was on would only lead to destruction and despair. Heroin wasn't the only substance that Keith bid farewell to on his tumultuous journey. His disdain for the concept of rehabilitation, coupled with a dramatic incident in 2006 where he fell from a tree, prompted him to part ways with cocaine as well. He later declared that he had given up everything except for marijuana. As the years passed, Keith continued to redefine his relationship with substances. By 2018, he had significantly reduced his alcohol consumption to the occasional glass of wine or beer. By 2022, even the allure of smoking had faded for the iconic guitarist as he embraced the wisdom that comes with age and found happiness without relying on his old vices. In a departure from his younger self, Keith resisted the temptation of acquiring new vices. In a candid statement to the Irish Independent, he expressed his disillusionment with drugs, particularly prescription ones like Xanax, describing them as institutionalized and bland. He emphasized his preference for the old-fashioned way of getting high, which is through music. From Choir Boy to Rock Rebel, Keith Richards' childhood was a roller coaster of unexpected contrasts. Shaped by the influence of his jazz musician grandfather, 
Augustus Theodore Gus Dupre. The young Richards was tantalized by a guitar perched on a high shelf, a challenge set by his mischievous grandfather. Determined and resourceful, he stacked books and cushions on a chair in a relentless quest to claim the coveted instrument. After finally reaching the guitar, his grandfather became his first mentor, teaching him the fundamentals of music and bestowing upon him what Richards fondly called the prize of the century. Before he became the epitome of rock rebellion, Keith Richards was once a choir boy and a boy scout. It's hard to imagine the iconic guitarist in such seemingly innocent roles, but these early experiences laid the groundwork for his future leadership and teamwork skills. However, even in these formative years, signs of his rebellious nature emerged, leading to his eventual discharge from the Boy Scouts after a tussle. Surprisingly, Richards also showcased his talent as a choir boy, singing soprano and even performing for none other than Queen Elizabeth II at Westminster Abbey. This early exposure to music in a formal setting left an indelible mark on him, setting the stage for his future musical endeavors. Continuing this musical legacy, Richards formed a group called Jamaica's Wingless Angels in the 1970s with his Jamaican Rastafari friends. Drawing inspiration from old choral hymns and nyabingi drumming, the group created a unique sound that echoed the influence of Richards's choir boy days, showcasing the depth of his musical journey from innocence to rebellion. Anita Pallenberg's Tragic Impact the year was 1965, and the world of the Rolling Stones was forever changed with the arrival of Anita Pallenberg. Her entry marked the beginning of a tragic yet profoundly influential chapter in the band's history. Initially drawn to non-Keith Richards guitarist Brian Jones, her relationship with Jones quickly turned tumultuous, leading Pallenberg to find solace with Richards. The duo established a home in London and raised three children, their union becoming an integral part of the Stone's narrative. Pallenberg was not just a guitarist's romantic partner, her influence extended deep into the band's creative process. She contributed backing vocals to Sympathy for the Devil, but her presence was not without controversy. Richard suspected her of having an affair with Mick Jagger during a film shoot an alleged betrayal that inspired the creation of the iconic and brutal song, Gimme Shelter. Beyond the music, Pallenberg molded the social circles and aesthetics surrounding the Rolling Stones. Her impact was so profound that Joe Bergman, a member of the Stones' inner circle, claimed Pallenberg was as integral to the band as Richards and Jagger themselves. Tragically, her involvement in the band played a role in sidelining Brian Jones. Yet Pallenberg's personal life with Richards was far from idyllic. Substance abuse marred their relationship, leading to a gradual drift that culminated in their separation in 1980. Around the same time, Richards encountered Patty Hansen at Studio 54, marking the beginning of a more stable chapter in his personal life. Their enduring marriage, spanning almost four decades, stands in stark contrast to the tumultuous union with Pallenberg, painting a complex and tragic picture of the woman who left an indelible mark on the Rolling Stones' history. The Glimmer Twins' Triumphs and Tragedies The legendary partnership of Mick Jagger and Keith Richards, famously known as the Glimmer Twins, is a tale of rock history marked by both triumphs and tragic rifts. According to the Washington Post, the first notable fracture in their relationship emerged in the mid-1980s. Jagger's decision to pursue his first solo album in 1985 and subsequent refusal to tour the Rolling Stones' 1986 album Dirty Work plunged the band into a prolonged period of conflict, described by Richards as World War II. This rift reached a point where the very existence of the Rolling Stones seemed threatened. Jagger's solo endeavors, coupled with Richards' own solo album in 1988, hinted at the potential demise of the iconic band. Despite the seemingly insurmountable challenges, Jagger and Richards managed to reconcile in 1989, salvaging the Rolling Stones from the brink of dissolution. However, 
The truce proved to be fragile as public jabs and strategic apologies continued to mar their relationship. In his 2010 memoir, Richards painted a tragic picture of the distance that had grown between them. He revealed that he hadn't visited Jagger's dressing room in decades, expressing a lack of enjoyment in spending time with his once close friend. The guitarist's memoir unveiled a darker side of Jagger, describing him as increasingly unbearable with an inflated ego during the 1980s. Rolling Stone magazine further exposed the extent of the tension within the band as members devised a covert method to criticize Jagger in his presence, nicknaming him Brenda or Her Majesty. This clandestine language allowed them to discuss their frustrations with Jagger while he remained oblivious in the same room. The saga of the Glimmer Twins is a roller coaster ride of triumphs and tragedies, showcasing the complexities of artistic partnerships and the enduring legacy of the Rolling Stones, Keith and Tom's tragedies. The bond between Keith Richards and singer songwriter Tom Waits is a unique and somewhat tragic tale of artistic collaboration that dates back to Waits's 1985 album, Rain Dogs. According to Rolling Stone, Richards, renowned for his guitar prowess, not only contributed guitar parts, but also lent his vocals to multiple songs on Waits's albums. In 2013, the duo recorded a distinct version of the sea shanty Shenandoah, showcasing the depth of their musical connection. The friendship between Richards and Waits runs so deep that Waits once penned a tongue-in-cheek poem titled Keith Richards, in tribute to the guitarist. This whimsical piece, reported by Rolling Stone, playfully compares Richards to a fax machine, delves into the color of his urine, allegedly blue according to Waits, and humorously likens the Rolling Stone to a praying mantis, noting that he only has one ear located between his legs. Despite their apparent friendship, their collaboration has its share of challenges. While Waits holds Richards in high regard, he acknowledges a dynamic that often requires an adult in the room. The two musicians attempted to co-write songs for Waits' Bad As Me album. However, the process took an unexpected turn when Richards, in a somewhat demanding fashion, repeatedly exclaimed, Scribe! Waits soon realized that Richards was seeking someone to transcribe the music they had been improvising for an hour, and that someone turned out to be Waits himself. Interestingly, Richards did not receive co-writer credits on the album, despite his significant contribution. He still lent his guitar skills to a few tracks, and Waits, in a nod to their friendship, dropped a reference to both Richards and Mick Jagger on the lead single, Satisfied. Keith's musical tastes and disdain. Moving on from Keith and Tom's collaboration, Keith Richards reveals a wide range of musical tastes that may surprise many. Beyond the boundaries of his iconic rock realm, Richards expresses a passion for the soulful voices of Amy Winehouse and the avant-garde stylings of Lady Gaga. His admiration for Gaga even extends to a nod of approval from the venerable Tony Bennett, a testament to the depth of his respect for both artists. While rooted in the classics of blues, gospel, jazz, and reggae, Richards breaks from tradition by showering praise upon a diverse array of modern talents. Florence and the Machine, James Bay, and reggae luminary Gregory Isaacs all bask in the warmth of Richards's commendation. Even Ed Sheeran, with his one-man band charisma, earns Richards's admiration, despite the amusing misstep of referring to him as Ed Sheeran. In a twist of irony, Richards displays a more critical ear within his own genre. Led Zeppelin is deemed a little hollow, though he affords respect to the legendary Jimmy Page. The Grateful Dead falls prey to the blunt critique of boring, while harder acts like Black Sabbath and Metallica are dismissed as great jokes. However, Richards's musical disdain reaches its zenith with rap. A genre he deems tone deep, lamenting the surplus of words with little substance. The tragic twist in Richards's fashion choice. In the realm of rock and roll, Keith Richards stands as a beacon of extravagant style, adorned in loud jackets, scarves, 
and an array of accessories that defy convention. Contrary to the assumption of a carefully curated wardrobe, Richards's style is a simple yet unconventional affair. He unabashedly raids the closets of the women in his household. The man whose fashion flair served as the muse for Johnny Depp's iconic Captain Jack Sparrow in the Pirates of the Caribbean movies has, for decades, donned women's clothes in a revelation that transcends the boundaries of conventional gender norms. Richards disclosed in 2016 that the majority of his wardrobe is borrowed from his daughters and his wife, Patty Hansen. Support for this unique approach to fashion comes from Richards' daughter, Alexandra, who attests that her father possesses a rare ability to wear anything, even venturing into the realm of his wife's pajama pants and somehow making it look effortlessly stylish. However, in a tragic turn of events, Richards's borrowing escapades took an unexpected legal detour in the 1970s. During a period when the band collectively sported similar jackets, ownership became a trivial matter. Unfortunately, this carefree approach led Richards into a perilous encounter with the authorities. A jacket he wore unknowingly contained pockets harboring illicit substances. The consequence was a brush with the law that forced Richards to shoulder the blame for substances he didn't even know were in his borrowed attire. Beyond the rock and roll chaos, beyond the wild electrifying performances and the endless road trips, there lies a side of Keith Richards that will astonish even the most die-hard fans. The rock and roll icon is not just a guitar god but also a devoted and insatiable reader. In a surprising twist from the typical tales of Keith's excesses and wild living, the Sunday Times has revealed that Richards' homes in both the U.S. and the U.K. are veritable treasure troves housing thousands of books. For Richards, reading was more than just a pastime. It was a lifeline during his challenging upbringing in the gritty streets of 1950s London. Reflecting on his early years, he once mused, when you're growing up, there are two places that shape you profoundly, the church, which is God's domain, and the public library, which is yours. The public library is a great equalizer. This deep reverence for the written word has turned Richards' personal collection into a one-of-a-kind library. At one point, he even toyed with the idea of organizing his extensive collection using the Dewey Decimal System showcasing a whimsical desire for order amidst the chaos of rock and roll. Alas, practicality won out, and he opted for a system that reflects his eclectic taste. His favorite books are within arm's reach, ready for moments of inspiration or escape, while the rest form a sprawling tapestry of literature adorning his bookshelves, infusing the space with the echoes of countless narratives and characters. It's clear that Keith Richards is more than just a guitar giant. He's a bibliophile with a passion for sharing the magic of storytelling. The Bentley That Rocked In 1965, rock and roll icon Keith Richards made a luxurious acquisition, a Bentley S3 Continental Flying Spur. This wasn't just any car. Richards bestowed upon it the name Blue Lena in homage to jazz singer Lena Horne. Over the course of more than a decade, Blue Lena bore witness to the eccentric and tumultuous life of one of rock and roll's most iconic figures. Amidst the trippy fog of 1967, following a drug bust, Richards took Blue Lena on a transformative odyssey through Europe, eventually reaching the vibrant city of Marrakech, Morocco. Little did he know, this fateful journey marked the beginning of his romantic entanglement with Anita Pallenberg, a liaison that unfolded in the back seat of the storied car. However, the tale of Blue Lena takes a tragic turn in 1976, when Richards, exhausted and perhaps under the influence, succumbed to sleep at the wheel. The consequence was a harrowing collision with a tree, leaving the rock legend with a nose indentation from the impact with the dashboard. Despite its scars, Blue Lena continued to be an integral part of Richards' life until 1978, when he reluctantly parted ways with the iconic vehicle. The car, however, went through various hands over the years, only to resurface in 2015, fully restored and ready to tell its tales at auction. According to auction house Bonhams, 
Blue Lena was more than just a mode of transportation for Richards. It was the vessel that carried the entire band to concerts, parties, and countless adventures. Richards himself described Blue Lena as a machine destined for nocturnal speed, embodying an anti-establishment spirit and a passion for trouble. The rare limited edition Bentley was, in his eyes, a symbol of rebellion, a possession he was not born into, but one that embraced the wild spirit of his rock and roll journey. The Haunting Villa Nel Cote. In April of 1971, amidst a gloomy atmosphere, Keith Richards sought refuge in the luxurious Villa Nel Cote on the French Riviera. The intention was to create the masterpiece album Exile on Main Street with the Rolling Stones, initially envisioned in a countryside farmhouse. However, the search for such a place proved futile, leading Richards to discover Villa Nel Cote, a property with a dark past. This sumptuous retreat had once served as the sinister headquarters for the Nazis during their invasion of France, evident from the swastikas that still adorned the basement walls. Undeterred by the dreadful history, Richards transformed the residence into a peculiar amalgamation of backstage mayhem and a hotel room on the brink of destruction. The eerie ambiance of Villa Nel Cote, exacerbated by its Nazi heritage, provided fertile ground for encounters with drug dealers, hangers-on, and renowned guests. The grand rooms exuded a stifling heat, while the moist walls and poor air circulation in the basement created a haunting atmosphere that permeated the recording sessions. These unconventional elements contributed to the album's distinctive muddy sounds, culminating in Exile on Main Street, now revered as one of the Rolling Stones' most esteemed works. Throughout his years of artistic endeavors, Keith Richards embodied a defiant persona. Recounting their time at the mansion, Richards shared a daring escapade involving himself and the band's saxophone player Bobby Keys. They pilfered their tour doctor's bag, a treasure trove of pharmaceutical wonders, and sought refuge in one of the mansion's bathrooms. Behind closed doors, they embarked on a drug-induced odyssey, oblivious to the impending calamity. Abruptly, the shrill wail of a fire alarm shattered the haze of their private revelry. Panic gripped the hallway outside as individuals scrambled to safety, oblivious to the escalating peril. Richards and Keyes emerged from their drug-induced stupor only to witness the bathroom engulfed in flames. Unwittingly, they had ignited a fire that threatened the iconic mansion. In his memoir, Richards portrays an even more dramatic rendition of the incident. Amid their euphoric exploration of an array of drugs, they noticed smoke filling the room. The bathroom curtains were ablaze, teetering on the brink of a catastrophic fire. Timely intervention arrived in the form of incessant knocking on the door, heralding the arrival of waiters and men in black suits, brandishing buckets of water. The two musicians, their eyes narrowed to slits, sat on the floor, perturbed by the abrupt intrusion into their private revelry. Keith's Arkansas's Odyssey from Arrest to Pardon it was a sweltering July in 1975, and Keith Richards, the legendary guitarist of the Rolling Stones, was on a musical odyssey across the American heartland. He was heading to Dallas, but he didn't take the highway. Instead, he followed the winding country roads of Arkansas, hoping to discover the origins of the blues. He had no idea that his adventure would take a dramatic turn in a sleepy town called Fordyce where he would face a legal nightmare that would haunt him for over 30 years. As he was cruising through Fordyce, Richards was stopped by a cop. The charge? Reckless driving. The cop didn't care that he was a rock star. He threw him in the back of his car, locked him up in a dingy jail cell, and slapped him with a misdemeanor. Richards had to appear in court, where he pleaded guilty and paid a $162 fine. It was a small price to pay, but it left a stain on his record and his trip through Arkansas. Fast forward to 2006, when Mike Huckabee was wrapping up his term as the governor of Arkansas. Huckabee was not only a politician, but also a musician. He played bass in his own band, 
and he was a huge fan of Richard's. By a stroke of luck, he met him backstage at a Rolling Stones concert. He decided to do something extraordinary and generous. He used his power as the governor to pardon Richards for his old misdemeanor. He sent a letter to the state parole board asking them to erase a Richards' conviction. The board agreed, and Richards was officially cleared of his crime. The irony was too good to be true. A reckless drive through the land of the blues ended with a pardon from a governor who loved the blues. Richards had finally found redemption in Arkansas. The rock star who won't die now. Many people wonder how Keith Richards does it. He has been the lead guitarist of the Rolling Stones since the 1960s, and he has lived a life of excess and adventure. He has been the epitome of drugs and rock and roll. In fact, in 1973, a UK music magazine predicted that Richards would be the next rock star to die. But he proved them wrong. Fifty years later, he is still alive and kicking, while many of his peers, like Jimi Hendrix and Brian Jones, died young. Richards has reached 80, and he is still rocking. He has not given up his wild lifestyle, but he has also not given up his music. He still tours with the Rolling Stones and makes solo albums. He still influences new musicians with his amazing guitar skills and his original style. Richards is the rock star who won't die and we love him for it. What do you think about Keith Richards' tumultuous life? Leave us your comments in the section below. Thanks for watching, friends. For a more inspiring video, while you're still here, click now on the next video that pops up on your screen.